the institute sort of has two elements, the, um, the think tank element and what we call the action tank element, meaning uh, we take the idea that uh, governance is key and that the way that we as citizens are managing our lives with each other um, is going to be sort of the greatest determinant in our lives, um, maybe next to culture. And, um, and therefore, the book is all around um, systems of governance and, um, and the effect on, on society. What we've done beyond the think part uh, is, uh, as I said, we've become really an action tank around a few um, sort of key issues that we think, um, frankly, are important and need reform. And we've sort of focused on three, very different. Uh, one is California. Um, the idea simply being that California is in itself almost like a country. If you think of California, it has 38 million people. It's got a um, GDP of, in dollars, around $2 trillion. So it's as big as really any uh, of the leading European countries. Uh, it's uh, almost as big as the UK. Um, so it's, a, it's an important place. It's also a place that has influence. It's a place that's been incredibly successful, but has enormous challenges today. Uh, the success, you probably know, um, not only the GDP that exists today, all the people that's attracted, but uh, it's a leader in technology, leader in media, leader actually in agriculture. So it's a leader in, in a number of different areas, but it has uh, today great difficulty in financing its future. It has a um, big fiscal deficit, um, and it has um, a large unemployment uh, even though it has success, meaning it has more than 10% unemployment, which is high uh, by US standards. So you have uneven distribution of, uh, let's say, economic spoils and probably uh, opportunities. And uh, the system in California has, um, um, we think, flaws that are truly structural, which is what we're interested in as, a, as an institute. These flaws are that the governor, who in theory is the boss, um, needs two-thirds majority from the legislature to get anything meaningful done. So all the issues that exist today, deficit and other issues of California, need um, uh, to be addressed. Uh, if the governor wants to make changes, governor needs a super majority, in essence, of uh, the legislature. Very hard to get in an environment where, in the US, you've got two parties. Uh, which, you know, historically have been, you know, reasonably equal. Um, so, and the legislature itself won't address the tough issues because they have an electorate to defend, um, and the electorate um, sort of hijacks uh, a lot of the legislatures with um, issues of their own. So, you, the California, we feel, has great difficulty in self. Um, um, uh, in, in reforming itself. And California also has a very interesting thing, which is that it has a uh, um, history of referendums to um, uh, actually get the big reforms done. And, um, and if you look at the US Constitution, I think there have been 26 or 27 amendments. I think California, which has a, when was the Constitution established? Um, <coughs> well, it's been amended. It's been amended 500 times. Yeah, it's been uh, amended 500 times. So the in, uh, California has been changed through amendments. So the reason why we, as a as a group, chose California is it's been successful, has a decent chance of being successful in the future. So it's a place worth fighting for, but it has enormous challenges, and you can actually make reforms uh, because of the referendum system. So that's. California, and I think the best that Nathan goes into great details about California because he is a Californian. Um, the next project, and I'm just describing them uh, uh, top down, uh, the next project is Europe. Um, 
Europe is a, um, again, something that we think um, is structural in terms of um, uh, problems. You've got a um, um, sort of a historical and cultural idea uh, and economic idea of a number of different countries being one, in theory, in terms of um, federating certain common goods. And there are a number of different things that today function as Europe. Um, let's say movement, uh, currency, um, number of different standards and laws. Uh, but this was done by treaties and fairly administratively. And today you've got, as an example, you've got a currency, um, which is a common currency, but you don't have a um, financing and fiscal regime that's common to all the countries that are participants in the currency. And you can see the challenges which it has created. There is no way that Europe can address the, the, you know, the, the, its economic environment in a way that's um, dynamic uh, because of the lack of power at the center to address, um, in this case, uh, to address uh, financing and fiscal um, uh, need. So we think Europe is um, a place that's been sort of half built, if you want. Certain common goods have been federated, but others haven't. And um, to get there is very difficult because each nation uh, has its own government, its own parliament, own parties, um, have given up some sovereignty to the center, but probably not enough to make the whole thing function, but never communicated to their citizens, um, to their constituency, uh, what the Europe project is all about. And uh, should they, and how much uh, sovereignty should they give the center? So we feel that um, Europe is a little bit like a sort of a house half, half finished without you know, the infrastructure, without heat, without whatever other things that it may, that uh, a good house needs. Um, and we've been engaged now for a while to address some of these issues. That's the Europe project. The last one is um, what we call a G20 um, project. The, G the, the world has changed. Um, you are, um, you're representing this change. Probably 50 years ago, everybody would have looked sort of similar, um, to, to put it uh, all look like me. <laughs> now we have, um, uh, and it's been so now, uh, we have much more diversity. And, the, and the, what used to be the G7, or G5, G7, G8, has now gotten competition. It's become the G20. Uh, Korea is at the table. Turkey is at the table. Brazil, Russia, China. Um, and um, that's really what the world is about. You don't have uh, one dominant um, ideology or nation. Um, it's a world that's, you know, a world in competition. Uh, but also a world that needs to cooperate with the idea of the G20. But the G20, which is a good convening idea, uh, brings those 20 countries together once a year under the leadership of one of the members uh, in a roving basis every year. And um, the idea may be good, but very little gets done in reality because all these 20 people have to get together come up with something that they all agree on, so it has unanimous consent uh, from Saudi Arabia to Argentina to China to the US. Difficult. Um, and secondly, the president of the G20 changes every year. Last president was, for example, uh, Calderon in Mexico. And he had an election a, year, a month and a half after his uh, G20. So. Imagine how focused is he on the G20 versus you know, his, his country and his elections. The next president this coming year is uh, President Putin in Russia. Um, again, and, and the year prior was Sarkozy in France. So you've got very different, um, let's say, leadership. Um, and how much continuity? So even if the 20 agree on something, who is going to follow through? So our group 
which, which includes some former G20 leaders, our group is um, trying to make the G20 more effective, not only in having a dialogue with the G20, but we're actually pushing to see how you can you carry out some of the things that um, the G20 um, proposes. Could you have you know, an institutional memory, institutional capability to carry out whatever the G20 <coughs> um, uh, puts on the table? So these are these three different projects, <coughs> um, quite different, but they are always um, interested in the structure, in the long term, in the governance issues uh, of, in one case, California, Europe, and then uh, the last one, the trickiest, frankly, is um, how do you have an influence on, on uh, you know, global governance? 